The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Hey, thanks for everybody being here this morning. Um, usually I kind of dread morning talks because you start, you don't see quite as many people, but this is a really good turnout. Thank you. Um, would everybody please give the organizers a hand? They've, um, I've, I've helped with a couple of fests. I've never had to organize a show from scratch, but I've helped with a couple of shows, and it takes a lot of work and for them to pull this off. And I've worked with the organizers as they were getting things together um, because I also help plan events for OpenSUSE, and they've done a great job. So um, I hope you all appreciate the work that they've done. So my name is Joe Brockmeyer. Most friends call me Zonker, so if you're wondering later, if you want to come up and say hi, you can call me Zonker, you can call me Joe, whatever you're comfortable with within those parameters. Um, so um, I work for Novell as the community manager for OpenSUSE, and so um, basically that means a couple of things um, that I do. Um, pardon me while I get back to my page of notes here. Um, so there are a couple of things I do. As I mentioned, one of the things that I do is I organize events for OpenSUSE, meaning you know, everything from talking to organizers, planning which events we'll go to, making sure some of the stuff shows up at the shows, asking for budget for items to throw out. Which brings me to my next point. One of my favorite parts of my job is that I pelt the audience with things <laughs> during my talks. So throughout, throughout the talk, I'll be throwing things at the audience. So those of you who decided to sit all the way in the back are probably going to lose out a little bit. Um, so anyway, uh, another thing that I do for Nobel is I'm sort of an ombudsman, if you're familiar with, with that term. Um, so I kind of work with the community, and then I go back to Nobel. The community gripes to me, and then I go back and gripe to Nobel. Um, and so I try to make sure that you know what the community needs, they actually get. Sometimes it takes longer than others, but that's part of my job. Uh, also, planning some of the infrastructure. Um, for example, one of the things I worked on over the last year was our trademark guidelines and some of the other things. We're trying to get our infrastructure straightened out. So those are some of the things that I work on. What I'm going to be talking about today is a combination of community building and marketing. Basically what you need to do if you're involved with a project and you want to try to expand your reach. I'm assuming pretty much everybody here uses Linux. Is there anybody here who's on the fence who doesn't use Linux, doesn't know what it is? It's okay. We'll be nice to you. You can raise your hands. Okay, nobody. All right. So I'm assuming the rest of you are here because you want to spread Linux and you want to see people using it, right? So that's kind of one of the things we'll be talking about. Or your particular open source project. I know there are some open Solaris folks in the house. They don't want to raise their hands? Okay. One guy. Brave man. All right. Um, so anyway. So... The point of this talk is I've been looking at this industry for a long time. Before I joined Novell, I was a journalist. And I've been running a Linux desktop since 1999 exclusively, um, meaning I do all my work on a Linux desktop. I install Linux on pretty much all my systems. And you know, I use Linux a lot. And I've come to the conclusion the chief problems we have right now are not technical. Um, they are marketing, they are educational, they're getting the word out, and they're explaining to people what Linux is and getting people to understand why they want to use it. Um, and so when you talk about marketing to geeks, you usually get kind of a, you know, that's evil thing. But marketing actually works. This slide may be just a little too verby in the morning. Um, so I'll give you guys a second. I'm starting to hear chuckles, so people are getting to the end. So, yeah. So basically, um, you know, marketing actually works. So whether you realize it or not, you get marketed to and you get messages sent um, quite a lot. Um, and the message that I have for you right now, something you want to take home with you and think about, is we are seriously outgunned. Uh, the other day I was having a conversation with somebody in IRC, and I actually went and I looked at Microsoft's uh, SEC filings. And they budgeted, I think it was um, $3 billion in one quarter for marketing, for marketing and sales. 
three billion dollars. To give you um, to give you perspective on that, if you take Novell's entire income for the year, and you take Red Hat's entire income for the year, and you take Canonical's entire income for the year, you don't get three billion dollars. So we're seriously outgunned, and that doesn't even that doesn't even touch Apple. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, so basically what I'm going to be talking about as I started the talk, reaching as many users as possible. Um, that means getting our message out. Getting more users and more contributors. You know, it's one thing to talk to people about Linux. It's one thing to be at, at an event and introduce somebody to concept and actually using Linux. And it's a step beyond that to get them to actually contributing to a project. I also want to talk about you know, improving the experience for contributors a little bit. So, <laughs> a lot of WKRP folks in the house? Okay. I gave this talk at scale, and the audience was drastically younger, so there was just kind of crickets when this slide came up. They're like, who's this guy? So you guys get what this isn't about, all right? We're not talking, I'm not going to get into branding. There's an entire sub you know, focus of marketing, which is branding, which I'm not worried about and we don't need to get into at the moment. I'm not talking about corporate marketing ca campaigns. I'm talking about grassroots marketing. Definitely not talking about sales. We're, you know, we're not trying to sell anybody anything. We're trying to give them something, um, which what an odd concept if you think about it. We've been trying for years as a community to give people Linux and they're still on the fence. Um, so obviously we may be doing something wrong. Um, not talking about spin, um, you know, I'm not talking about the thing that people think is evil about marketing and PR. And I'm not talking about selling people something they don't need. Um, if you take one thing away from this, when you talk to somebody, if you have an open source project or if you're talking about a Linux distro and it's not right for them, back off. Because nothing is worse than giving somebody a bad first impression. Okay? So. First rule of you know improve of getting your reach out there as a project is don't suck. And I'll explain why this picture sucks in just a minute. Um, basically, there is absolutely nothing you can do if your project sucks. Okay, no amount of evangelism in the world, no amount of going out and getting in front of people in the world is going to have any effect. Some people are brave enough to come in and sit in the front, so I'm going to allow the thing in their direction. Good arm. All right. So why why does this picture suck? Um, I took this in my local grocery store. Um, I live in Florida. <laughs> okay. By the way, when I took this picture, the guy working in produce got very nervous because I'm standing there with my camera phone, and the guy's like, "Why is this guy taking a picture in my department?" And he came over to to intercept me. But so. First lesson is don't suck. If your project sucks, you know, it's good to have a marketing team that, that works with people and everything, but the first thing to do is make your project not suck, okay? Second thing is planning. Have realistic goals and have a way to measure your progress, okay? Um, for example, right now I can tell you we have about 28,000 members to our forums. This year, or last year this time, we had Zero, big goose egg. So we have measured that throughout the year to see how those forums have grown, okay? Um, we have in our build service, how many people are familiar with the OpenSUSE build service? All right, this time next year I want all the hands to go up. The OpenSUSE build service, and I'm a, this is five seconds of actual advertising here. OpenSUSE build service is a free software project that is not specific to OpenSUSE. We use it to build our distribution but it's also available to build packages for Fedora, for Debian, for CentOS, for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, for Ubuntu, and for Mandriva, and for different versions of, of those distros. It can be used to develop software. So for example, uh, everybody knows the next Firefox is right around the corner, right? How many people want to upgrade to run the next Firefox? No, I mean upgrade your entire distro. <laughs> right. Um, so you can actually go to the build service, and if somebody has packaged it and put it there, you can actually build Firefox for an older system and get it out of our build service. 
This is how I can run the latest GNOME and KDE on an older install of OpenSUSE, for example. Um, so that's part of the build service. It's also free software. Anybody can download it and install it. Um, Moblin has been using it. Uh, nice cooperation there, story there, sort of. Moblin now bases itself on Fedora packages, and they use our build service to build Moblin. Um, so anyway, that's our build service. Going back to this, um, my point of mentioning the number of users we have and the number of packages in our build service, which is, by the way, more than 68,000. The reason I mention that is because I track this. This is one of my metrics for success, is that that number is always increasing at a steady clip. If it's not, there's a problem. Um, so we have goals and we measure them. And we're trying to find more ways to measure. Unfortunately, OpenSUSE, um, the history of SUSE was it was a distro that used open source software but was sort of built in a proprietary way. We're changing that. But that means that a lot of our processes and tools need to be revamped. It also means we don't have a good way of distinguishing between internal and external contributors. So we need ways to count, you know, like who built a package, because right now we don't have the tools to do that. We have, instead of going to the powers that be or the other project planners and saying, you know, we have X number of internal and X number of external people developing, we just have sort of anecdotal evidence. Well, I know this guy who does 20 packages and he doesn't work for Nobel. Um, so we need to measure that better. But anyway, the point is, you need to be able to measure projects' progress. By the way, feel free to jump in with questions if you have them during the talk. Um, I'm happy to make this more interactive. That's why I'm throwing things at people. Um, and to keep you awake. They told me throwing coffee would be a bad thing. Um, so the next stage is communication. Um, communication in a office. How many folks work in an office where there are politics and things like that? Okay, how many of you think communication is hard just with people you're local to? Okay, imagine the fun you get when you're with a project that has several development offices and distinct cultures. We have a large contingent of folks from Germany who are known for their warmth and politeness. Um, <laughs> We have a large number of people in the U.S. We have some folks who participate from Latin America who are becoming more prevalent. Um, we have some folks from Japan. Uh, I've, by the way, visited many of these people, and I've found that there are some very interesting and spectacular language and cultural barriers. Um, and then there's the tools. How many of you have gotten into an argument over email and found out that it was just a misunderstanding because people aren't good at communicating via text instead of speech? Okay. So there is a lot of work to do when it comes to communication. Think about when you start, if you have the luxury, by the way, of planning out a project from scratch instead of it, it growing organically, think very seriously about communication and where you have discussions about certain things. IRC, for example, great to just jump in and talk to people real quick. Lousy medium for propagation of knowledge, because what you get is, well, this guy was logged in at this time, and this guy was logged in at this time, and something, an important discussion happened here, but only these five people participated because it was 3 a.m. on the West Coast, kind of thing. Think very carefully about how you structure your conversations and your communication. Email is a lousy medium to decide anything complicated. Um, so think about forums, think about more collaboration tools. The open source community, by the way, needs more collaboration tools, better collaboration tools. Um, one of the things we're working on, for example, that's a good collaboration tool, or we're trying to make a good collaboration tool, uh, is Kablink, for example. And so I'd invite people to check that out. Um, you like how I just slip in just little, you know, plugs for things? Um, Kablink? I can spell that. Thank you. Um, Oh, no, it's uh, K-A-B-L-I-N-K. So, um, solid project infrastructure. This is really important, and this is one of my pain points. Um, OpenSUSE, quite frankly, um, our infrastructure could be best described as whimsical at times. Um, it's definitely something we've been working on over the last years. But there are a couple of points of infrastructure. One point is just the servers that things reside on and whether or not things stay up. The other part of infrastructure is that, again, going back to the build service that we've been working on, whether or not your tools allow you to do the things that you need to do. 
Um, when the project started, we did not have a good way to allow people to contribute to the project because people who didn't work for Novell and who weren't behind the firewall, they had to go through a gatekeeper to submit changes and they had to go through gatekeepers to submit things. And we had two obstacles there. The first one was the tools, the second one was our policies. We got rid of the first one about nine months ago and we got rid of the second one a couple of weeks ago. We now have a policy where we are creating core teams where anybody can contribute. And we, have a poly and we have tools that allow anyone to contribute. The tools no longer reside behind a firewall. Okay? So think about when your project is, is getting started, whether or not anybody who could contribute can contribute easily. Because you want to remove those speed bumps to contributions. And you definitely want to remove speed bumps to use. If people can't get and use your software easily, they're not going to. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So this is uh, another one of my philosophies. People may disagree. Um, my philosophy in a lot of places, if you're coming at it from leading a project, if you're coming at it from a company sponsoring a project, lead and then get the hell out of the way and let other people do it. Because if you are one of, say, 10 people employed to work on a project, there's no way in hell you have the bandwidth to scale to a thriving project. Um, what needs to happen, generally speaking, is put out an idea and let the community run with it. And one of two things will happen. If it's something the community cares about and wants to see happen, they will run with it and it will happen. Period, end of story. The open source community has proven this time and time again. When people care, things work. When people don't care, things fall apart. Or when not enough people care, things fall apart. And if you care about it as a company, either you need to look at those things and you either need to fund them completely or you need to let them die if there's something the community doesn't care about. Um, one example, and I hate to pick on uh, the Red Hat Fedora folks, but I'll pick on them. If you look at um, the Fedora Legacy Project, that was something that didn't succeed over time because not enough people wanted to get into it. Um, enough people cared about it to start the project and to get, to get it going, but not enough to, to sustain it. Um, and this obviously wasn't something that uh, the corporate parent wanted to sustain. And again, that's not a knock at you guys, just you know, as a good example. Um, if you look at, for example, um, Mozilla Suite, not Firefox, but the Mozilla Suite, there are still enough dedicated volunteers, at least the last time I checked, to keep putting that out on a regular basis. Um, so there are things that people care about, things that they don't. We just started, finally, an ambassador project. Thank you for the name. Um, and um, basically, my philosophy was that, you know, we, the first week or so of that, I kind of lobbed it over the wall once we got it ready. Um, and a lot of people were like, wait, this isn't completely defined. You don't have everything here. And I'm like, that was the point. Because the people who are going to be doing the work are not me. And you need to define it. And you need to run with it. Because if, if I tell you how to do everything and there's no creative thinking and no buy-in on, on anybody's part, it's not going to succeed. Because there are, not a, there are not an army of people out there that get up in the morning and say, I want to take my direction from some guy in Florida. You know, they want to do what they need to do to make things succeed. So I think I've, I've beaten that horse enough. Distribution. This is one of my long-term pet peeves about some open source projects. How many people have ever said, you know, hey, um, I need to fix this problem, or I want the latest release, and the answer is great, get it out of SDN. Is there a lot of that? That's a problem, because how many users are going to take the time to get to know SDN and do a checkout just to get the latest release of something? Um, this is one of the things that our build service is designed to solve, and this is also a thing that a lot of a lot of open source projects are getting better about. But you know, if you look at Ubuntu, for example, they did a great job when that project launched of distributing Ubuntu to everybody who wanted it. I mean, I think they were just behind AOL in terms of shipping disks out to people. Uh, so the budget for that must be tremendous. Um, but it worked, right? You know, I wonder where Ubuntu would be today if they had been stingy with the disks. Because a lot of people, I think, started with it because they shipped out disks. Um, distribution is very important. Making it easy for your target audience to get software in a format that they want is very important. So 
that's one of the things that we focus on through the build service, through our DVDs and so forth. You know, we've got tons of DVDs out at the uh, desk, and we try to make live CDs available on the site so that people who don't want to download an entire DVD can get that. Um, if you are in a project that's complicated to install, think about making a VMware image available or a Zen image or something like that so that people don't have to go through the entire install just to try it. Um, there's a project, that's, the name uh, is escaping me, Bitrock, the Bitnami stuff. How many people have heard of this? Oh, man. This is a great project I have no affiliation with. Bitnami is, um, what they do is they create a software stack that all you have to do is grab the Bitnami stack and you're running something like WordPress or Track or something like that in like five minutes. You don't have to have Apache or MySQL installed on your system before. You just go get the Bitnami stack, download it, and try it. It's like crack. So if there's if there's some server-based software you've been thinking about trying out, go look at Bitnami because they usually have a stack available for the most uh, popular stuff. Um, so that's another way to get things uh, going. Another thing that every good project needs to get the word out and to reach as many people as possible is evangelists. I used to kind of shy away from this word because um, if you pay attention to the way that the IT press and other people have talked and written about open source over the years, evangelist is kind of a negative connotation because it has a religious connotation. And people have beaten free software advocates over the head with the religious label for years, and I've always hated that. Um, but you do need people who go out and evangelize your project. project. Um, you need people, and to get people to go out and do this, they have to be happy about your project. They have to be enjoying working with your community, okay? We have some great evangelists in our community. Um, you know, we have some folks who, for example, work with the OpenSUSE Education Project who go out and they take OpenSUSE to schools, and they help evangelize open source software to people who aren't already involved with open source, okay? Um, this picture, by the way, the reason I took this, um, the guy at the far end is, uh, his name is Satoru, and I met him in Tokyo. He's one of our evangelists, he's one of our enthusiasts in Tokyo, and he's been doing great work there. Um, and he's one of the people I think about when I think about evangelists, okay? Any questions or comments so far? Is everyone still with me? Oh, wait. Why are forums better than email? Um, generally speaking, I think that people, there are a couple of steps involved with, with going to a forum and posting. Email is part of people's normal workflow, and so they get something in their inbox, they, they respond off of the top of their heads, and it's gone. There's also the fact that a forum thread is a little bit easier to follow and wade in in the middle. You don't have to take, you don't have to subscribe to a mailing list and deal with all the spam, or not to spam, but the, but the noise, signal to noise problem. You can go and search out something in a forum that you want to participate in. So there are a couple of reasons. It's a, it's a slightly higher bar of participation in some ways. Like. And that's good because when you're having a conversation in email about a policy or something, you want the more interested people who are more um, motivated to participate in the conversation rather than the folks who just riff off their opinion but probably aren't going to follow through on a lot of things. That's my thought. You look skeptical, but all, that's... All three to disagree. Okay. Um, I like that it's part of my work, but i Yeah. I mean, that's a nice thing about email, but then again, there's also kind of some downsides to email. So, any other questions? All right. I think it's time to throw something else. Yeah, I'll try it for the back of the room. All right, got the first row. So the next step, if you're actually trying to um, get your word out about your project, um, you may be stunned to learn that as a former journalist, I would actually suggest that you learn to work with the media. Um, and let me give you some of the background there. Um, this has been a bad year, by the way, for the media. I'm on a mailing list of other professional journalists. And um, I remember one day in March, I think it was, you know, People on the list talk about what happens to them professionally, and every once or twice a month for the last couple of years, you'd see somebody come on. I am looking for work. I just got laid off, or 
they've shuttered my magazine or whatever. We had a day in March where like three people the same day got laid off from different publications. Um, it's been a bloodbath over the last year in the IT press. The, one of the effects of this is the people who are still working in the press are scrambling and they are usually overworked. If you show up in front of them with information that they can write a story quickly and satisfy a deadline, they love you and you're probably going to get very good coverage. Um, a couple of things about working with the press. I've noticed that free software advocates have a tendency to shoot first and ask questions later. When they see a story appear in the press that doesn't meet their liking, they tend to, let's say, respond less diplomatically than they could. That's a bad idea. Um, journalists are supposed to be neutral, but they're humans, okay? And if you have 15 people from a project flaming a guy because he got a fact wrong, um, the odds are the next time he writes about that project, if he chooses to write about that project again, or she, um, do you think they're going to have a wonderful mental image of your project when you choose, when they come around to it again? Or maybe they'll think the next time around, you know, the last time I wrote about Project X, um, they were really prickly about it and they corrected every little thing, you know, or whatever. Maybe they'll just choose to avoid that pain in the future. So when you deal with other people professionally, especially journalists, um, I would advise doing it carefully and diplomatically. Yeah. Uh, um, you need to, so if you want them to actually write about, say, I'm assuming, I'm going to assume you're coming from the Ohio Linux Fest angle. Um, if you want to get somebody from the general media interested, you have to have a local hook. You have to have them, give them a reason and, again, kind of hand it to them on a platter, especially because then you're dealing with somebody who just does not know your project at all. Um, so you really need to, you know, sell it to them in a way that they're going to understand and see why their their viewers or their readers would care. Um, that would be my, you know, my suggestion. Um, and I would also start approaching them very early. Don't, don't go to local press two days before your event and say, hey, we're doing this thing in two days, can you do a story about it? Because they may have their stories planned out a week or two in advance. Um, so start talking to them, you know, for Ohio Linux Fest, start talking to people in August um, and that sort of thing. Any other questions? The other thing I would say about working with the media is have really good release notes for your project. Have screenshots. Have everything that a journalist would want on hand right away. There are a lot of bloggers and people right now who, again, are just trying to hit massive, ridiculous deadlines. They're not going to take the time to do a screenshot tour of their own. They're going to reproduce screenshots, so have some ready. Have somebody who is available pretty much on less than 24 hours notice to respond to press inquiries. Um, if somebody from Linux Weekly News emails you on Monday, their deadline is on Wednesday. So if they email you Monday requesting comments for a story, then you need to be able to reply by Tuesday or you may miss the book, okay? Um, and it just depends on the publication. Um, also, how many of you like money? <laughs> There are people who are not raising their hands. I'm not feeling full honesty here. Um, so if you like money and you like your project, I have a way you can combine those two things. Um, a lot of the IT press, again, is sort of, uh, there's a lot of freelancers and stringers, and a lot of publications depend upon freelancers to contribute a large amount of their content. As somebody who edited a magazine and a website for some time, I can tell you that it is much harder than you would think to get people to respond to waving a check around to show up with a well-researched, decent piece on software. Uh, you will not get rich doing this, but if you want to make a couple hundred bucks fairly quickly, often you can do so by approaching the right technology publication and saying, hi, I participate in this project and I'd like to give you an in-depth tutorial on this or I'd like to do this. And this will do two things. It will put a little cash in your pocket and it will get the word out about your project. Okay? Um, and also, third bonus, uh, it never hurts on your resume 
and how many people are thinking about their resumes these days. Um, never hurts on your resume to have a little line that's a line item of publications, okay? Because we all know that empo employers prefer people who are good at written communications and who are who have a name. So think about that next time you're thinking about how do I get somebody to write about my project? Don't wait for somebody to write about your project. Go to a publication and say, I'll do it. Just, you know, work with me. <laughs> The next alternative is to actually become the media. This is something that um, different parts of the open source community have done a great job at. Um, how many people read Planets on a regular basis? Like Planet Ubuntu, Planet Fedora, OpenSUSE, or SUSE? Um, Jeff Wad, another fellow whose name escapes me, came up with software called Planet that aggregates blogs, okay? And so you can install this and your project can have a planet where people can come and have a one-stop shop to read all the blogs related to your project. Um, these are pretty handy. It doesn't take that long to blog. People tend to get freaked out, I think, by the blank page. Start a blog if you're not blogging already, if you contribute to a project. Um, it does not have to be complicated. If you've read Michael Meeks's blog, for example, um, you know he puts up there every day, I poked at, you know, I poked at mail, I worked on this bug, I did this. But the important thing is it gets the information out there so people who are interested in, his, in GoOO know what he's working on. Um, they know to approach him about certain topics. They know not, by inference, they know not to approach him about other topics. Um, and they also know what he's thinking about where he's going with the project. It's much better than just tossing code over the wall every six months. Um, so that is a good thing. It does not have to be, you know, Hemingway. You can just a couple of paragraphs every once in a while on what you're working on is great. Podcasting, I don't personally listen to podcasts, but that's a good way to communicate with a large segment of the audience. Um, how many people actually listen to podcasts? My God, okay. Um, I just, I can't work to people talking, so I, I, tend, to do, I tend to do all my work to music. Um, so, but podcasts are a good way, and I don't have a commute, I work from home. So, you know, I get out of bed, I take a shower, I go downstairs and I work. Not really a lot of opportunity for podcasts there. Um, any questions about this? Back in the back. Oh, no, he was waving at someone else. Um, no? All right. Finally, uh, one thing I want to talk about is collaborate with other projects when possible. It's, you know, this was one of my goals when I started with Novell last year, and we've had some success, but a lot less than I would like because of various reasons. It's, it's, um, it's less trivial than I had hoped to actually collaborate and communicate with other projects and pull things off. But in open source, it is important to think about, look around before you reinvent the wheel. Um, make it, try to break out infrastructure that other people might want. And, you know, go out and look for other areas to increase, other ways to increase your surface area. Um, I think it's really important for projects, especially Linux distributions at this stage, to not keep reinventing the wheel. You know, if something isn't vitally competitive and important, share it with other projects because you don't have to carry the maintenance burden on your own. Um, by the way, this picture, this, why this represents collaboration, this was uh, from the Google Mentor Summit last year, um, and that was a great opportunity for anybody participating in Google Summer of Code. If you have the opportunity to attend this event, I strongly recommend it um, because it is a really good chance to talk to a lot of different projects. So over the last year, for example, OpenSUSE ha has started taking some things from other distros, like, for example, we've taken Smolt. Uh, we're using that a little bit. Um, I know other distros, uh, looking at Presto, for example, are using some of our infrastructure in the form of Delta RPMs. Um, and so those are some great examples of things flourishing outside of the respective projects. So, any questions on that? Finally, this is my philosophy. Do something even if it's wrong. Um, I have watched way too many projects deliberate and discuss and, and him and ha and talk about things for months and months and months that takes longer to do something and make a decision than it would to do it, find out it was a mistake, undo it, and do the right thing. Okay? 
Don't spend all of your time worrying about not making mistakes. Making mistakes is just, it's going to happen. Make them quickly and get them out of the way. Okay? Learn to say we screwed up and not feel embarrassed about it. If you're doing good work and you do something and it turns out we made a boo-boo, that's okay. That's why you release early and often. Okay? We think about it that way with code, but not always that way with projects and not always that way with, with other activities. So if you take anything away from this talk, um, I would say that that's the most important point. Pull the trigger when you get to a certain point. Don't discuss things to death. So and that's all I've got for this particular talk. <laughs> if anybody has questions or comments, uh, now would be the time. I still have a couple of geekos, so people with good questions may be rewarded. Yes? Uh, you mentioned some problems with email and some problems with forums and with, with, with communicating and making decisions being difficult because it's difficult to follow conversations, to jump into the middle, to mm -hmm. keep track of everything that's going on. Yeah. Google's new Wave product is designed to address some of those things. Do you see that taking a, an active role in free software development to help you do uh, I could give you a firm maybe. Um, <laughs> So I haven't, I haven't dove into it too deeply. From what I've looked at, it, w it looks immensely sexy. Um, and um, it depends on how much of it is open and how good the free software and Linux tools are. Um, I certainly like what I have seen so far. I think they have some great ideas. And I'm glad that somebody is willing to blow up the normal email thought process. So one way or another, I think it, it'll play some role, but how much and whether it's Google Wave or something else, they've got people thinking about alternative ways of, of doing that. Um, I've been doing email now for 15 or 16 years, and I've never used an email client that doesn't suck. It's just how much. So I'd like to see something new. Um, so thank you. Yes, sir. I'm sorry about that. There was a mistake. <laughs> Actually, I did talk a little bit about it. Even though I'm from North Carolina and live in Georgia now, it was far enough to figure that out. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> I've got to drive through Georgia. I've had a thought process that's been ongoing for 10 or 12 years about breaking some mindsets. And, and you know, there's all sorts of things, whether it's public education, private education, K through 12, or at a university level. Mm -hmm. uh, just if, if you can, in, in three or four minutes or less, what, what is a Nobel thing? What is open suit for you to think? About specifically? Uh, you know, uh, strategies, I guess. You mm. talk about marketing, and, and that's exactly right. what I think has to happen. But I don't think there are as many of me as there are of folks who just say, okay, well, whatever. It comes pre installed with the machines that we're getting. So. Right. Um, so, quick thoughts on that. I can't, I don't speak for Novell officially, so we'll restrict my thoughts to OpenSUSE. Um, I think one of the most important sub projects in our larger project is the education project for a couple of reasons. Um, people get started on, you know, learning the computer, and I hate to use this word, but I'm going to paradigm early, right? And so if they get used to Windows early, they're going to kind of get used to Windows long term. That's obviously not good for us. Um, there's also the fact that people tend to, in my experience, anecdotally, I don't think there's good research on this, People tend to attach to open source projects in late high school, early university. And so if we want to reach contributors, the time to do it is in those, in those years. Uh, so I think it's really vitally important to get into education, and it's an area that we need to focus on. We have two problems, uh, major problems in that area. Number one is inertia. Um, there is not a lot of incentive for a lot of educational institutions to change, right? Um, because people, in my experience, in IT and education are not measured by results quite the same way. Um, 
and may be content. And they may not, in fact, in a lot of times in smaller districts, that may not be their only job. So strategizing about a new platform is not their first goal. Um, the other problem we have there is, frankly, there's not a lot of money in education when you compare it to other industries. Um, if you have to look at Wall Street customers versus education, which vertical do you spend your money on as an open source vendor? So that's another problem there. Um, this is one of the things where open source enthusiasts are going to have to apply a lot of love and, and elbow grease if we're going to succeed. So, uh, and you know, over the next year, I can't make any firm commitments, but I can say that education is featuring very large in my planning for OpenSUSE on the marketing side. Well, it's just interesting to me. I, I have gone through this entire sort of Microsoft sort of piece of my life, and, and you know, it's like they used to say on Saturday Night Live that you know, Microsoft is very, very good to me for a long time. <laughs> I've never heard anyone say that, but okay. <laughs> My wife's a school teacher 30 plus years, and sometimes I just scratch my head. That's the thing with the education. People walk in and say, if you can save $5, yeah. why can be this big? If you're scared of it, start small. Yeah. But you can say $5. I, mean, I guarantee you that most people don't have a clue how much they pay for licensing. Oh. That's when the big software company comes in and we'll cut $5 off your license just to use the rest of it. <laughs> so, but thanks for the question. Um, anybody else? Yes, sir. Earlier this week, I needed to uh, get the latest version of Better Than Pay, and the only way I could do that was through SDN. Uh -huh. So clearly, there's some movement in the community uh, away from this easy tarball package thing to, you want my stuff? Here's how you get it. just cut and paste this line. So I, I got to disagree with your, your comment about SDN's too hard. All I have to do is cut and paste. Um, I would suggest that you're probably a little more knowledgeable than the average user. I um, <laughs> it, it may not be too hard for you, but um, for example, let's take my girlfriend's kid who wants FFmpeg for something they're going to get frustrated and they're going to want to go use a Mac. Um, most users are going to get frustrated and they're going to say, uh, one of the mistakes that we make, I think, is that we as a community value free software and we value open source for, um, for reasons that are beyond the practical implications. And there is a large philosoph philosophical component for us. Um, most consumers don't have that, and we have to recognize that. If it's too hard to use the software, they won't. They'll go back to the proprietary software they're comfortable with. So that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. We, you know, I don't think anything of getting into SVN or, or doing a command line thing to get something. I've done it for 10 years. But when it comes down to, you know, the guy down the street who I gave the OpenSUSE disk to who's tried it and liked it so far, but then he decided he wants to do task X or Y and wants to get this software. And the only way to do it is out of SVN. When he doesn't even know what source control is, we have a problem. So. Well, yeah. You get heavily into yak shaving the first time you have to get source code too. Everybody familiar with yak shaving? Good. Okay, I love that term. Um, any other questions? Oh, by the way, this guy has a brilliant name tag. So <laughs> it's an LED scrolling name tag. It's brilliant. Um, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you deal with um, being plugged into a bigger you know the Linux community and, and 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 all that being Novell as a company being plugged into that mm -hmm. and say you know the Linux community decides hey you know we want to take a particular suite of software like GNOME, KDE or whatever we want to go in a particular direction 
Okay. And and Novel obviously doesn't write the software, so they just kind of take it and pack it to another distro and run it. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that from a, um, you know, we want to do this, but the community wants to do that, so we kind of have to do that because that's what everybody else wants to do. And how do you deal with that from a, a marketing perspective where a customer comes in and says, okay, um, we want to be able to do this, this, that, and that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and maybe it's a request that doesn't really doesn't fall under what like you guys as an umbrella, right. where they want to do some kind of you know major change to how the GNOME works, or how KDE or whatever this right. is. And how do you do? How do you tell the customer, well, you know, we, we don't really do that. You know, that's that those guys do that, and then they they do it where we feel like it was open source, and, and that's how it works. So. Okay, so the question, um, I haven't been repeating the questions, bad on me. The um, question is basically how, do we, how does Novell deal with the fact that open source projects kind of go in their own direction, whereas we may have customer requirements, and I have 30 seconds, so I'm going to talk very quickly. Um, basically, we go with the flow is the short answer. We employ people to work on GNOME, a lot of them, or a fair number of them, and we try to participate with the project in such a way that we can get things in when we think they're important, but if the community does not go in the direction that we want to go, that we have to cope and, and compensate for that. And we have to go back to our customers. And again, I'm not going to the customers, I'm going to the community. But we would have to go to the customers and say, this is open source and this is the way it works. Um, in the past, Novell has developed some things outside of that chain, and it's always kind of been, it's, it's not worked for the best if you look at the way comp is and some of those things work. Uh, so we've learned that it's better to try to work within the community. Um, the better example of that is on the kernel level. Um, and we do a lot of work in the kernel, and a lot of other companies do the same thing, to try to get the features in that we want. But we can't force it, and it's a bad idea to ship a patch set that isn't in the kernel. So, And that's all the time that I've got. Thank you very much for your kind attention. This work was recorded by VIEW Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, share alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.